One of the questions that I have been receiving pretty consistently at this show, which I'm delighted about because it means that people are really now looking toward the uh, 2110 and NMOS solution is, this is great in a lab where you've got 15 connections or around here where you've got 50, but what about 75,000? What, what about, you know, whatever, but yeah. some large number, will it scale? So we really thank our, our members and our colleagues at Sony for heading up a group in the AMWA that's been looking at scalability of these systems. Rob, take it away. Thanks, Brad. So yeah, um, this, um, welcome to this talk on AMWA, NMOS, ISO 4 and ISO 5 scalability and performance. Um, I'm Rob Porter from Sony Europe. We're based, actually based in the UK. Um, and I've divided divide this talk into three parts. Um, in the first part, I'll give a, a brief overview of the AMWA ISO 4 and ISO 5 specifications. Um, some of you may already be very familiar with them, but I think it's important to understand what we're measuring the scalability of. So I'll go over the APIs and then some of the open source software that's available. In the second part, I'll define um, the terms of the scalability study, what our aims were, um, our methodology, and then present some of our results. And finally, discuss best practice recommendations and some areas of future work that we recommend as well. So starting with part one, naturally. Um, so there's a massive transformation going on in the industry at the moment from SDI to IP, as we can all see here on the stand today. And this means we have professional media IP networks that can look something like this. It's obviously a very small scale one, but we have here uh, various senders and receivers uh, sending and receiving different essences over the network. So we have video, audio, and ancillary data um, being carried as separate packetized streams over the, the network, uh, typically as ST2110. And the timing's provided by a PTP clock, which you can see up there as the studio reference at the top. So what about um, discovering new devices that have been attached to the network? What about managing connections between these devices? This is where the network media open specifications come in, or NMOS for short. And that's what we'll be focusing on in this presentation. So these are developed by the AMWA, the Advanced Media uh, Workflow Association. And I'm going to focus on two of the specifications. AMWA ISO 4, that's Interface Specification 04, for discovery and registration, and IS05 for connection management. And these, the important thing is these are open specifications, so they allow interoperability between different manufacturers' devices. So we're not all using proprietary protocols, we have truly open specifications, and we can guarantee interoperability, as you can see on parts of the stand over there. Um, ISO4 and ISO5 are RESTful APIs, so that means they're using operations such as HTTP POST, PUT, patch and get, as well as things like WebSockets, which allows you to subscribe to something and get notifications of changes, for example, when new items, uh, new NMOS nodes are added to the network. So starting with ISO 4 uh, for discovery and registration, the key thing here is that we add a registration and discovery system, or an RDS for short, to our network. And this comprises one or more registry instances um, these basically include a database that stores all the registered uh, resources on the network. And the RDS exposes two APIs, a registration API and a query API. And when you attach an NMOS node to the network, it will register with the RDS using its registration API. So it's a good point now to ask, what is an NMOS node? Well, it's basically an endpoint on the network. It's a logical host connected to the network, and it can host one or more NMOS devices, each of which uh, could have any number of associated senders, receivers, sources, and flows. Um, so a, a source is basically a, um, a, something like a camera, and a flow is a, a representation of that source as a stream, and the sender makes that available over the network. So that's kind of the difference between a sender and a source in NMOS speak. These are all known as resources, and they're all defined by the JTNM content model. And I'll show you some examples now. So an IP-connected microphone, that could be, um, that would be a single node connected to the network with a single device 
with just one audio sender. Uh, an IP-connected camera could be, again, would again be a single node, it could be a single device with two senders this time, an audio sender for the microphone and a video sender for the camera, and two receivers. These could be uh, return channels coming back to the viewfinder for the camera person. The third example here is an SDI to ST2110 gateway. So this is very useful in the transition to 2110 from SDI. Um, there are many legacy devices that still only support SDI, but we can use gateways to make them available on our IP networks. In this case, this is again represented by a single NMOS node with a single NMOS device and three senders, one to convert the, um, the video from the SDI stream into ST2110 video, one for the audio and one for the ancillary data. And a slightly more involved example here, this is an IP multi-viewer. Uh, there's an example in the corner over there of a 3x3 three three multi-viewer, which happens to be what we have on the slide as well. This time we've represented that with um, nine different devices, one for each picture-in-picture picture within that multi-viewer. And each device has three receivers for, again, for video, audio, and ancillary data. That's not necessarily the only way to represent a 3x3 three three multi-viewer. You could have a separate device for each essence type, for example. But that, that's typically the way manufacturers choose to represent multi-viewers, and it, it's exactly how it's done on the stand over there. So the process on connecting one of these NMOS nodes to the network, first thing it does is um, it tries to discover any RDS that exists on that network, and it uses this using DNS service discovery. This could be multicast DNS, or it could be unicast DNS. And I'll go a bit more into the pros and cons of those later in the talk. Once it's discovered uh, an RDS, it will select, um, if, it's, if it discovers a whole list of them, it will select the one that has the highest priority, the registration API of the highest priority. And then it will register its own node resource with that selected registration API. But of course, it has many sub-resources as well, the devices, senders, and receivers, and so on. So it will then go on as separate API calls to register each of those sub-resources to the registry. At the same time, it will begin to post regular heartbeats to the registry. And what it will typically do, the recommended heartbeat interval, is that every five seconds, that NMOS node will send a message to the registry to tell it it's still alive. Um, and then typically, there's a registry expiry interval of 12 seconds. So if the RDS, the registry, doesn't receive a heartbeat within 12 seconds, it will expire that node from the registry. It will throw it off. So we could have several NMOS nodes registering with our regist registry system. And what, what's of interest to us in the scalability study is what's actually going over the wire, because this is what we're measuring the scalability of, in effect. So for an NMOS node registering to the registry, it's this kind of information. So it's doing an HTTP post from the node to the RDS, and it's posting to a particular um, URL on that registry, and it's posting some uh, a JSON file that's got information such as what type of resource it is, a node, uh, the host name, a description, and some URLs which are useful for making connections between nodes, which I'll come on to later. So it's basically quite a small amount of data going to, to the registry. And the registry will then reply back with a message saying that has successfully been created and with a unique address for that node on the registry in case you want to delete it later. Um, over the registration API, you can also use that address for some debug information. A uh, heartbeat is somewhat smaller. That's just a very uh, short HTTP post operation uh, to the health endpoint on the registry. And it gets confirmation back from the registry each time saying that it's received that heartbeat and with a timestamp. So that's the kind of information going back and forth with these uh, RESTful APIs. Once we've got all the information in our registry, we want to be able to control connections um, on our network. And first of all, we need something like a broadcast controller or a routing panel um, to be able to do that. And these are known as an NMOS client. 
and the MMOS client is able to, we'll add one to the network there, broadcast controller, it's able to talk to the RDS over the ISO4 query API and get a list of all the registered resources. And here you can see them appearing on, it, on its GUI, so you can then go ahead and make connections between them. Um, you can also get the NMOS client to subscribe to WebSockets notifications of changes in the RDS. As I mentioned earlier, so each time we add a new node or we make some changes to that node, the uh, broadcast controller, the NMOS client, will become aware of that. But what about making connections between the nodes? Well, that's where Amware IS05 comes in for connection management. So now the broadcast controller will, can use the NMOS um, ISA5 connection API to make a connection. It no, it no longer needs to talk to the registry to do this. It already has all the information it needs from the registry. Instead, it will talk to the, the, sender, the sender's node first, and it will get the transport file, which is basically uh, typically an SDP file that contains information about the, the format, the frame rate, and so on of the, um, that the sender's been set up to send in. You can also make changes to that over the connection API if the, if the sender supports that. Um, that SDP file also, importantly, contains the multicast address that that sender is sending on. And then the broadcast controller will go ahead and patch that information to the receiver, so the receiver now knows which multicast address to subscribe to in order to get the... Um, the essence stream from the sender. And it will then do that by doing a multicast join, such as an IGMP join. And once it does that, the network will be able to start sending packets from the sender to the receiver, and you get a nice picture on your, on your receiver on the monitor in this case. And that's using standard networking protocols. Um, ISO 5 includes some more sophisticated features, such as a two-stage connection. So you can stage your connection and then activate it later on. You can time that activation to be delayed to some later point in time. And you can also do bulk mode connections, so you can set up a connection for the, the different essences, the different senders on the sending node to be received by the receiving node at the, all at the same time, if you want your audio, video, and ancillary data all to switch at the same time, which would take typically be the case. Um, now I just mentioned some open source software that's available. So if you want to get started with ISO 4 or ISO 5, um, we found it very useful early on um, to use the Stream Pump Media as a, as a guide to how to implement these things. This is a, a Node.js implementation of ISO 4 version 1.0. So it doesn't actually support the latest version, but it was very useful just to get going. The BBC R&D uh, implementation is um, known as the reference implementation. It's been used at many interoperability events in the past. Um, and that supports both an MOS registry and Node. Uh, we've now at Sony developed our own implementations, both of an MOS client. So that's basically a web-based GUI where you can um, query the registry to get a list of all the resources and make connections between them using ISA 5. And we've also now implemented a, a registry in an NMOS node um, in C++. And this is the NMOS CPP library. Uh, I should say all this open source software is available under the Apache 2 license, so it's completely free to download and use. So a bit more about NMOS CPP. Um, as I said, it's a NMOS registry and node implementation in C++. We're actively developing that and supporting it. And you don't need to sign a contributor license agreement or anything to get involved. You can, you can download it for free and get started with it. Um, this is what we've used to do most of our scalability results. So that's one of the reasons I've mentioned it today. So now, going on to the scalability study itself. Um, so as Brad mentioned, a key requirement for the and where ISO 4 and ISO 5 APIs is that they can be used reliably at scale, and we do get a lot of questions about this. And we're talking about very large networks comprising many thousands of NMOS nodes, and that could be tens of thousands of NMOS resources um, that you might find in a real broadcast installation. And this is why within the AMWA, we've set up this scalability study. Um, Sony are leading this, but we've had uh, contributions from other members as well, and regular WebExes, and conversations and feedback about this. 
what we chose to do for the study was to make use of a virtualized network to make the timing measurements of various uh, of these operations at scale. The reason we chose a virtualized network is that it's the kind of management layer, the control layer that we're, that we're measuring here. It's these API calls over the network. We're not actually making measurements of the physical essences, the ST2110 over the network. It's just these AMWA, these um, ISO4 and ISO5 API calls. So we felt a virtualized network was valid for this, but it, it would be good to confirm some of the results on the physical network as well. So the virtualized network we chose to use is called Mininet. This is available as open source software um, on the internet. It's not, not made by us, it's out there, it's free to use. Um, this allows you to extend, um, to simulate a very large number of network endpoints and different network topologies with different numbers of switches and endpoints. What we've done at Sony is we've extended that for NMOS, so you can run NMOS processes on those endpoints. So to go into that a bit more, you, have a, you start with a physical host computer. That could be any operating system, Windows, Linux, or Mac. Within that, you have your Mininet virtual machine, which is a Linux virtual machine. And you open your command window on that, and you can set up um, a, diff a topology of your choice. And it starts by adding a network controller, which, which is optional. That's the kind of SDN approach. And then a number of hosts. So here we've chosen 1,600 different hosts. The hosts within Mininet are basically um, lightweight containers. So they each have their own virtual network interface card. And there's some separation between the processes that run on them within the operating system. So it's a, it's a fairly good um, simulation of actually running things on different physical devices. We can then add a number of switches and links between the switches. And finally, start the controller, start the switches, and start a command line interface for Mininet itself. And then within that, we can use our extended version of Mininet to start a registry on host number one. You can see it appear there. And then run a variety of nodes on all the other hosts. So here, in this case, we've got um, 1,599 nodes starting up on there. We can then do things like make timing measurements. So what we've done for that is we've used the log created by our registry, which logs everything that happens on it in real time. From that log, we're using a custom plugin on Logstash to extract the logging information, put it in an Elasticsearch database, which then drives a Kibana dashboard that draws some nice graphs in real time of everything registering to the network, to the registry. So the first result here, um, this was the, the maximum number of NMOS nodes that we ran on our, on our Mininet network, 2,500 NMOS nodes. Um, it's all running on one physical PC, so this was um, a, a fair accomplishment. But each of those NMOS nodes actually includes many sub-resources. So in this case, we've got each node can, including one node, one device, one sender, one receiver, one source, and one flow, basically one, one of each type of sub-resource. So we've actually got 15,000 NMOS resources, each of which are having to do a separate API call to the registry um, to register, as I explained earlier. And what we found in this case was we had a total registration time of 3 minutes 42 seconds. But you can see that the kind of pattern of registration here, it started off very slowly, then we had a nice linear part where everything's registering at a constant rate. And then we had a bit of a tail at the end where the last few resources were getting registered. So we felt that further optimizations were possible. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But first of all, we also tried this process with various smaller number of nodes to check the kind of pattern we were getting as the number of nodes increased. So with this result, we tried anything from 100 up to 2,500 NMOS nodes and repeated that experiment. And we got the results plotted on this graph here. And the good news is there is a linear relationship. So as the number of nodes, as the number of resources increases, um, the time taken to register increases linearly. What we didn't want to see was a kind of exponential relationship where we're seeing the time kind of shoot off the scale here, which would indicate there's some kind of bottleneck, some kind of scalability problem. So we felt this was a good result for scalability. 
So going back now to the, the shape of the registration graph, um, we scaled down to 750 nodes just so we could run multiple tests multiple times without waiting three minutes, 42 seconds every time. And um, we saw we still got the slow start and the long tail on this graph of initial registration. And with a bit more investigation, we realized there were two reasons for this. So the slow start was actually down to the discovery mechanism itself. Um, so in this implementation, we were using just multicast DNS, MDNS. And we had two implementations of this we tried, uh, both the Bonjour implementation and the Avahi implementation. And in both cases, we found that the registry was getting somewhat overwhelmed by um, re requests from the node on startup. And what happens is once the node has discovered a registry, um, uh, an MDNS advertisement on the network, it, it goes back and forth asking a few questions as to what type of service is being advertised and um, asking for the text records, which include information such as the priority information. And all those kind of back and forth um, operations, sometimes they were timing out just because the registry has got 2,500 separate nodes asking all those questions from the beginning, or 750 in this case. So what then happens is once it's um, failed to get a response the first time, it will back off and try again a little bit later. And we found that back off period by default was actually 30 seconds, which was pretty long in the context of what we're trying to do. So we tried reducing that right down. Obviously, if you reduce it down to um, too short a period, you're still overwhelming your registry constantly. But by turning it down to about five seconds, this DNS SD retry interval, we managed to get rid of the initial slow start and get something more like this. So that was a good result. The long tail that you can see in the top graph was, was a similar type of thing. This was actually during the, the call to the registration API itself. That was also sometimes not getting a response from the registry, and it would time out for 30 seconds before retrying by default, and we could turn that right down as well. And again, we found that about five seconds was a good retry interval, resulting in this fast start and short tail you see in the bottom graph here. And this actually reduced our registration time in this, this case from over 50 seconds to less than 30 seconds. And for the 2,500 node case that you saw on the first result, on the earlier slide, we went down from 3 minutes 42 to 2 minutes 11. And we think actually starting up 15, having 15,000 resources getting registered and ready to use on your registry, on your network from startup is, is actually a pretty good result to be able to do that in two minutes. So, so we're, we're fairly confident you know, that we've got good scalability here. Another thing we wanted to try was the recovery of the registry after a network link failure. So on Mininet, you can virtually pull the plug on the network for, for any of the host processes, for any of those um, Mininet hosts. And we did that on the, on the host that was hosting the registry process. And at time, th these parts of the graph, you just have to interpolate between, by the way. You just get a dot there when there's no data in, in Kibana. But at time A, we basically virtually pulled the plug on our registry for five seconds. And you can see that a few things um, expired from the registry. So even though we only pulled the plug for five seconds and the expiry interval on the registry is 12 seconds, the registry would have definitely missed one of the heartbeats, which happen every five seconds. Some of the second heartbeats, um, when the registry was reconnected, got missed for whatever reason but only a small proportion of them, and they all managed to re-register within a few seconds. So 25 seconds after reconnection, 30 seconds in total, we had uh, a fully occupied registry again with all our resources re-registered. When we pulled the um, virtual network cable out for 30 seconds, um, this time 30 seconds is well over our um, registry expiry interval, so absolutely everything at time after time C got um, expired from the registry. And only after we'd put the cable virtually back in again and everything had managed to re-register, after 90 seconds do we have all our resources back on the registry. But it still shows that um, it could reliably recover after a network link failure. 
We did try changing that heartbeat interval to lower levels than um, five seconds and, and higher values as well, and the registration expiry interval. But we actually found that those kind of recommended values in the MOS specs are, are pretty much spot on. We couldn't get any better results than using those. You don't actually want to increase the registry expiry interval by too long, or you end up with stale resources on the registry. Nevertheless, it might be worth making those configurable, and I think that's already recommended in the spec. So a few other highlights from the study. I haven't got time to go into detail on all of these, but we are publishing a, a paper at the SMPTE annual technical conference next month that will have a bit more detail on some of these on them. Some of them are still work in progress. Um, registry discovery, I mentioned we're using multicast DNS. This is sufficient for small layer two networks, but um, as you may have heard already during the talks here, you really need unicast DNS for layer three networks, and this is in the AMWA spec, um, so it's recommended everyone use that. Um, as well as allowing scalability across wider networks, this also we found with some basic experiments improved the registration performance for large deployments because we didn't all have all these questions and answers going back and forth to MDNS. Um, things were able to discover the registries much more quickly. Also using multiple registries is a good idea. So we did these experiments with just one registry, but we, did, we repeated some of them with a cluster of registries. And in this case, we also saw improved registration performance and better tolerance to network link failures as well, because it adds some redundancy to the system, some, some high availability. Um, another question that regularly gets asked by AMWA members is, why don't we just use a bulk API for registration? Why do we have to have a separate API call for each resource that registers with the registry? So this is something that's definitely worth further investigation, uh, particularly when we use something like ISO 7 that David talked about in the last talk, where we've also got additional resources registering with the registry. It may be a good idea to be able to register everything from one node in bulk. Um, some experiments we've done indicate that might be a good idea, but we need, um, we need some more results to, to prove that. Um, but that is a potential enhancement for the um, ISO 4 that may be worth thinking about in future. So finally, just to um, reiterate some of those points, really, our best practice recommendations from what we've done so far, make the timeouts and retry intervals for DNS, SD, and HTTP configurable. Also do that for the heartbeat interval and registration expiry interval, although we haven't been able to find any better settings than the recommended ones as yet. Um, use clustered registries, use multiple registries. Don't just rely on one registry unless you've got a very small system, because that leads to better fault tolerance and improved registration performance. And use uh, unicast DNS SD as well as multicast SND. DNS SD for greater scalability and improved registration performance as well. So some of the future work or the ongoing work we've got going on within the scalability activity. Uh, we're testing connection management as well. So this is more based on ISA 5 than ISA 4. We want to make sure we can do multiple connections all at the same time. We're testing the effect of multiple network interfaces for redundancy. So as well as having um, ST2022-7 on the data network, you can also have redundancy on the management network, or indeed you can use your AMWA ISO4 and ISO5 APIs on the, on the data network where there's already redundancy. So we wanted to test the effect of that on the APIs and on the scalability of the system. As I mentioned, we want to check out the effect of a bulk API for registration, and also, um, it would be good to confirm some of these tests with other implementations. We focus mainly on our own NMOS CPP implementation. We did use one of those other open source implementations early on in the study and confirmed we're getting the same kind of results. But if any other manufacturers want to get involved with their own um, implementations and they're members of AMWA, the Mininet test environment is available on the AMWA GitHub for everyone to use. So please do get involved. and see if you can repeat some of our results. Um, and as I also mentioned, we'd like to repeat some tests on, on a physical network. Uh, we, with, within our lab, it was impractical to scale up to um, ten, um, thousands of endpoints and uh, tens of switches, but 
um, it would be good to do a, a kind of smaller scale test and make sure we're, we're at least matching those timing figures or thereabouts. So for more information, um, we are presenting at the Sumter Annual Technical Conference next month. So please either come along or check out the paper online for more detailed results and explanation. If you want more of the tutorial stuff from the beginning of the talk, um, there is a longer version of that that I gave at the NAB show that's available on the IABM website. And also, please go ahead and use our open source software, which is free to use. Um, finally, as well as thank you for listening, thanks also to the other AMWA members for all their contributions and feedback during this study, and especially to the team back in Basingstoke who's, who've produced these results and done all the work. So thank yeah, you. Here, here. Brad. Thank you.